let's begin our journey into world of transfer pricing and let me introduce yogesh from my team leadership team who is part of this webinar and who will help me to go deep into transfer pricing laws so with this let me introduce uh, yogesh hi yogesh now you can Hello. take take it from from here and let's go deep into transfer pricing laws and let's uh, uh, hope that with our linkedin live today's linkedin live more and more businesses will get aware in terms of why transfer pricing is required in their business and how to how do how do they navigate this complex uh, structure in their global business over to you yogesh Hi, right, so thank you, sir, for inviting me for this discussion, and a very good afternoon to all our viewers. Let's start the transfer pricing discussion slide. Let's uh, go through the index, which gives us a brief walkthrough of the topics which we are going to cover in today's discussion on transfer pricing. We'll start with the background of implementing transfer pricing. Here we will discuss the background with the example of income and expenses. We'll also go through the meaning and the principle of triggering transfer pricing. Then we'll go through the transfer pricing non-applicability under what circumstances the transfer pricing provisions will not apply when SSE. The basis of determining associate enterprise, which is very important in this discussion, is covered under section 92A. And what is international transaction? What constitutes specified domestic transactions? What is arm's length pricing and methods of computing it? We'll also go through the maintenance and keeping of information in documents under the transfer pricing regulations, which is a very key issue, and the reporting of international transaction and specified domestic transactions under the transfer pricing regulations, where we will go through the threshold limits, the forms which are you know, prescribed for an SSE to file, and the stringent penalties if uh, under the circumstances of non-compliances. So let's start with the background. So here, suppose I've taken an example of expense. So there's an enterprise as Unilever UK, and there's an enterprise HUL in India. Both of them are associate enterprises. So what happens is that the Unilever UK sells a soap to Indian associate enterprise at rupees 10. The same product is sold to a non-associated enterprises at rupees 6. So there's a difference in the pricing. You know, and eventually paying lower taxes in India. So the consequence of this would be that the authority will disallow for you know expense of the Indian entity and charge tax on it. Next, we will check the example of income. So suppose there's an enterprise Tata Motors India, and its associate enterprise is there in the Jaguar Land Rover in the UK. Both of them are associate enterprises. The Tata Motor sells the car formula in exchange of royalty of rupees 10 crores to the Jaguar Land Rover UK, while the same you know, car formula is sold at a price of rupees 50 crores to the non-associate enterprise. Suppose the non-associate enterprise is located in Thailand. So there's a disparity between the you know, same product with regard to the pricing. So here what happens is that the India books the income from UK lower than the income received from Thailand. As a result, sale of India is understated, which eventually leads India paying lower taxes. So the consequence of this would be that the authority will add income of rupees 40 crores to the Indian party and charge tax on it. The other party, UK cannot claim allowance of expense just on the ground that its associate enterprise, which is the India, the Tata Motors, income was increased so as a parallel expense should also be increased to the UK party So this is not allowed under the transfer pricing regulations so just on the ground that uh, you know the counterpart associate enterprises income has been you know enhanced by the income tax authority and tax has been you know charged on it the counterparty the other counterparty cannot say that uh, my purchase you know my my purchase or my sales would also be you know enhanced and my tax liability should come lower that cannot be done under the transfer pricing regulations so this was the background i have taken the income and the exam and the expense example to establish uh, you know the base of the transfer pricing 
let's go through the meaning of the transfer pricing transfer pricing relates to the determination of correct market price and this correct market price is called the arm's length price the section 92 establishes the principles of triggering transfer pricing here what happens that if the transaction takes place between the associated enterprises the transaction should be an international transaction or it can be a specified domestic transaction the transaction should involve sale of goods or provision of services or both expenses incurred including interest on loan say uh, uh, with regard to the if i would like to cite an example for the interest on loan say one associate enterprises gives loans to the other associate enterprises at uh, you know 24% interest rate is paid so while the in, while in the market it's just the 9% so this also constitutes you know a uh, kind of international uh, transaction and there's a disparity between the rates so this is also covered under the principles and the transactions and the the next would be the allocation of the apportionment of cost or ex expenses so all these circumstances if they collate then transfer pricing provisions would trigger now let's analyze under what circumstances the transfer pricing provision will not apply so if the determination of a transfer price results in reducing the income chargeable to tax or increase or increasing the losses of the SSE, then the transfer pricing rule will not apply here i would like to give an example suppose a transaction has incurred between two associated enterprises suppose it was about 50 crores and when the tpo or the ao went through the you know analyzing the arm's length price of this transaction and they conclude that the arm's length price is 40 crores instead of 50 crores. So this would reduce the income. So in such circumstances, the you know the transfer pricing provisions will not apply. Another is for the domestic transaction, where if the aggregate specified domestic transaction does not exceed rupees 20 crores. So a threshold limit has been you know prescribed for the specified domestic transaction, which is 20 crores. So in these two circumstances, transfer pricing provision will not apply under section 92.3. Next is how to determine associate enterprise. This is very important for all of us. So the basis of determining associate enterprise is given under section 92A. So the criteria one is that one of them is a non-resident and the other can be a resident or both of them are non-residents and the income of either of them is accessible under Indian Income Tax Act. This is the first criteria in case of an international transaction. The second criteria, which, you know, there are some 12 to 13 criteria which we will go through. That has to be also, uh, you know, that has also to be established in order to establish an associate relationship, which are the equity holding, the equity in two or more enterprises the loan guarantee or borrowing governing body by enterprises governing body by same person manufacturing processing of goods raw materials so if any criteria is satisfied then the two or more enterprises will be called associate enterprise the next is like sale price and conditions to sales controlled by individuals or relatives or jointly you know controlled controlled by huf members or members relative or jointly control uh i think this is we'll check this the deemed to be associate enterprise so if any of this this is just a brief we will deep dive into all these criteria so if any of these criteria is satisfied then the two enterprises will be called associate enterprises and if there happens an international transaction between them then transfer pricing regulations will come into the picture so Yogesh, I think we should go back on this associate enterprise def definition because the pillar of transfer pricing provision is actually to determine whether the two enterprises are associated or not. Uh, in right. the sense that two enterprises are connected or not, related or not. And if, if the taste of water under transfer pricing is being, is being proved, then both the enterprises will be associated. And the moment two enterprises are termed as associated enterprises, then all the provisions of transfer pricing law will apply to 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 the related party association associated party and all the compliances needs to be done so i think if, if i just go back 
in terms of what is criteria number one. The criteria number one is that one of them has to be non-resident and other can be resident. So very sure. interestingly, can be resident. The, the meaning of this is that not mandatorily the other has to be resident. And many people think that if, if both of our related party are outside, then there is no transfer mm -hmm. pricing law, right? So, right. so, so it can be, uh, it can be, and both of them are not, or both of them are non-resident and income of either of them is accessible under income tax act. So basically what does it say? Ki either one can be outside India or if both are outside India, then one of them, their income has to be taxed in India under right. other provisions. It can be through poem or it can be P or it can be through uh, uh, other uh, D DTA provisions their income has to be taxed in India. So if that is the case, then that is associated. And criteria number one is that you are associated either by way of equity holding or by way of equity in two or more enterprises. That, that's the cross holding or there is a loan arrangement, guarantee or borrowing or governing body. Governing body means that there is a control over one enterprise over the other enterprise in terms of their survival or day-to-day -day activity or economic benefit, right? Right. Or dependency is big. So, so number one and number two is because of the equity holding. Right. Number three to number eight is because of control. Right. Now, and all these are economic control or uh, governing control. For example, loan is economic control. Now, you have given loan to someone, mm -hmm. and the quantum of the loan or 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 the arrangement of the loan is such that the other party is totally dependent on you. So, it can be loan. It can be guarantee or borrowing. So, you have given guarantee for your so so even though there is no related there is no equity holding but there is a uh, guarantee or or boring guarantee or boring given then 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 there, there can be related party governing body common uh, say common board of directors board of directors having control by a different method by agreement by way of uh, uh, indirect way of control or the one party is dependent on other in terms of manufacturing why i'm going deep into this because we all feel that Okay, th there is no there is no common shareholder, there is no common director, so there is no associate enterprise. Or both of our both of the enterprises are outside India, there is no associate enterprise. I think this is very very important to understand. We can we can go to the next slide, Yogesh. Absolutely, sir. Uh, so just just and just just go back just to continue sale. So if if you can if you can determine the sale price of the other, or if you can if through indirectly they own through jointly through relatives or through HUF control. So basically, if, if you go to the crux, if you go to the crux of uh, how do you determine associate enterprise? So I think we have to unlearn the idea that associated enterprise is only because of cross shareholding. The associated enterprise is there if there is a control. Yeah, and right, control sir. can be from different ways. Either it can be economic control, it can be ownership control, it can be management control. If there is a control which is substantial on other on other party through which control they exercises the control and determines the economic behavior in terms of pricing or in terms of how they operate, then both the enterprises are associated enterprise. So this is the pillar of the transfer pricing laws as far as I am concerned. Absolutely, sir. So let's sir uh, analyze each of these you know criteria. So the first one is for the equity holding, which is the most simplest form that if one enterprise is holding 26% or more of the equity of the other, then both of them would be called the associate enterprise. This is the most simplest form, which all of us know. And uh, let's analyze the other, you know, if there is, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, if 26, if uh, one enterprise doesn't host 26%, uh, it will release the relationship not to be an uh, associated enterprise. There are the other, you know, criteria from, you know, 2 to 12. Let's check each and every one of them. So the other one is of the equity in two or more enterprises. So suppose if there is an enterprise A, which has an equity holding in enterprise B and also in enterprise C. So A and B are associate enterprises by, you know, by the equity holding. And A and C is also associate enterprises, but there is no, you know, holding between B and C. 
So under the transfer pricing regulations, the B and C would also be considered as an associate enterprises. That is what this chart explains us. That is enterprise A holding equity of more than 26% of other enterprises, say B and C. Yes, the other enterprises, which is the B and C are associate enterprises among themselves. This is what this chart says us. Let's analyze the other criteria from three to 12, which is of the loan. The, this criteria says that has one enterprise given loan to other? If yes, then we have to check the threshold, which is that is loan given more than 51% of the book value of the total assets of the loan receivers enterprises. The enterprises who receives the loan, if the quantum of loan is you know 51% or more of book value of the total assets, then the giver and the receiver enterprises would be deemed to be associate enterprises under the transfer pricing regulations. This is what uh, the loan criteria suggests. It comes with uh, you know a threshold limit, which is of 51%. This has to be evaluated. Next is guarantee or borrowing. So has enterprise B taken any borrowings? Suppose outside, you know, not from enterprise A, but from outside. If yes, then has enterprise A given guarantee of 10% of its total borrowing? So here also a particular threshold limit has been prescribed. That if 10% or more of the guarantee is given by one enterprise on the for the other enterprise, then both of them would be called associate enterprises. Even though there is no equity shareholding, there is no you know loan given as we have studied in the above criteria. Still, if the guarantee, you know, grant guarantee provision is satisfied, then both of the enterprises would be called the associate enterprises. Right. So I think I think as we were discussing earlier, also guarantee or borrowing is also important. Just go back. So now we are getting into in detail in terms of all those nine uh, criteria: loan, guarantee, equity, or cross holding. Right. 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 And and this is this is very self-explanatory in the sense that if if you given a guarantee of the so if if I have what I have understood that if I have a loan of hundred CR and if you have guaranteed a loan of more than ten CR on my behalf, that somewhere we are related. Absolutely, sir. So I think that ten percent is very very important now. And this is very, very common in, 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 in business parallels with wherein out of friendship, out of a common community, out of common group, people just say, I will guarantee this loan to you while taking bank loan. And no one even notices this fact on the bank loan paper. They just write this, this entity is guaranteeing this loan. And most of the case, it might be more than 10% of the total loan. Yes, no one yes. goes and sees whether whether they are related party or not. And now with with more disclosures coming in and and the the, the the implication of transfer pricing will become very, very important. right? So this is very, very important. So uh, let's take the fifth uh, criteria, which is of the governing body of an enterprise. So in case of director or governing body, if the appointment is made by other enterprise, if yes, then both of them would be called the associate enterprises. So on one side, the you know director or the governing body is given. On the other side, in case of one or more executive directors or executive member of the governing body, if the appointment is made by the other enterprises, say uh, enterprise A appoints the governing body of the enterprise B in terms of whether it be the director or whether it be one or more directors, then both of them would be called the associate enterprises. Right, right, right. The next one is the governing body by same in, same person. So in case a uh, director, again, it's the, you know, if the same person is appointing the director of the governing body or, you know, one or more executive directors of uh, executive members of the governing body, then both of them would be called the associate enterprises the difference between the you know the the, the last uh, criteria and this is that the here the appointment was being made by an enterprise of the other enterprise and here the appointment is made by the same person of the other enterprise 
Next is the of the manufacturing or processing of goods. Here, what happens that if uh, is manufacturing processes or if is manufacturing or processing of goods is wholly dependent on other enterprise? If yes, then they are associated enterprise. So such dependency can come in the form of you know use of know-how, patent, or the copyright, trademarks, license, franchisee, or any other business or commercial rights of similar nature or any data documentation. So it's it's more kind of you know dependency of one enterprise on other enterprise in relation to their manufacturing or processing of goods. If such dependency comes into the picture, then both of the both of the enterprises would be you know associate enterprises. Even though there is no equity shareholding, there is no loan, there is no you know guarantee given given for the loan or the borrowings, or there is no you know appointment of the governing body. If this criteria is satisfied. That the dependency of you know manufacturing and processing of one enterprise is dependent on the other. Yes, they are called the associated enterprise. The next one is for the raw materials. Here again, a threshold limit is given that if 90% or more of the raw material or supplies of one enterprise is provided by the other, if it's yes, then they are associated enterprise. So in the earlier slide. The manufacturing and the processing of goods were dependent on the you know the know how the patent the copyrights or the trademarks. Here it's more of kind of raw material. So and there's a threshold limit is also given, which is the 90%. The next is for the sale price and conditions to sales. So when sales are made to other enterprise, are sale price and other conditions to sale determined by the other enterprise? If it's yes. They are associate enterprise. So here the sale criteria is being governed by the other enterprise or the you know the conditions in associate or the conditions associated with the sales. The next one is for the control by individual relatives or jointly. An individual control one enterprise and practices controlling on the other enterprise by himself or through relatives or jointly. This is the one of the you know most common used to uh, i mean this is was the one of one of the most common modus operandi which you know ssc used to take where one ssc used to be the owner of the enterprises in, in india and he used to make the you know her, her his wife the owner of the another enterprises which is located in dubai so if there is you know control by individual so if such kind of you know if such kind of appointment is made then both of the enterprises would be called the associate enterprise Again, uh, we'll be discussing the co uh, control by HUF member or member relatives or jointly. So a member of HUF or relative of such member or jointly controlling the other enterprises, if yes, then they are associate enterprise. So suppose there is an enterprise which is governed by an HUF in India and one of its member becomes the, you know, the owner in the other enterprise located in Dubai. So here is the here the criteria is of HUF members or maybe the if it's not the HUF members then maybe the relatives of the HUF members if they become the owner in you know outside India then th these two enterprises would be called or termed as associate enterprises and would be governed by the transfer pricing regulations. Okay, the second and the twelfth one is of the. Uh, this is here. Here, what what is happening that if ten percent of the profit sharing interest in firm or AOP or BOI controlled by other enterprises, if yes, and they are associate enterprises. So suppose there is a foreign enterprise who's who has the you know ten percent of the profit sharing in the firm AOP or the BOI located in India. Then both of these, you know, enterprises would be called as associate enterprises. So these were the twelve criteria. Apart from the twelve criteria, there is a particular criteria which is given, you know, under which uh, the two enterprises would be deemed to be associate enterprises, which is mentioned in section ninety-two B. So what happens over here is that it covers those transactions conducted between two unrelated party with the intent of influencing pricing between two associate enterprises then such transaction shall be deemed to be transaction between two associated enterprises here in the in this chart i have explained that uh, suppose there is a company a in india and there is a company b in australia 
so they are already associate enterprises among themselves company a wants to sell goods to company b whose alp is 200 crores but company b wants that to be at a price of rupees 80 crores for this a dummy company c is opened where it is opened it is opened in new zealand so what happens here that the company a transfers the goods to its unrelated party at rupees 80 crores for further transfer it to the company b which is located in the australia and the company c transfers the goods to b at rupees 80 crores so under these circumstances you know the conclusion of this is that if it is proven that the transaction between a which is the india and the b and the c which is in the new zealand was controlled by company b the other associate enterprises located in australia then even though a and c are unrelated enterprises they will be deemed to be associated enterprises and hence the transaction will be international transaction and shall be governed by the transfer pricing regulations next is uh, what is international transaction so the uh, a, in a simple word, I would say that every transactions between two enterprises, most of them, almost all of them would be an international transaction, whether be it in the form of purchase or sale of goods or services, likewise. So what the, what this slide explains us, let's uh, read out. The scope of international transaction is very wide under the transfer pricing. It constitutes of transaction between two or more associated enterprise. International transaction can be of the following nature. Here, the transaction head is given, and under each transaction head, I have described the transaction type. So, suppose if there is sale, purchase, transfer, or lease, or use of tangible or intangible assets, that will also be uh, that will constitute as an international transaction. If there is a provision of any services, including provision of market research, market development, agency marketing, legal accounting services, etc. Likewise, for the capital financing, if there is a lending or borrowing, whether short term or long term, any type of advance payments or receivables or any debt arising during the course of the business, then that will also constitute as an international transaction. The list is more that if there is a transaction impact, impacting profit or losses, which includes any other transactions having a bearing on the profit income losses or assets of such enterprises that will also constitute as an international transaction if the uh, international transaction will also include the transaction related to restructuring so a transaction of business restructuring or reorganization entered into by an enterprise with an associated enterprise irrespective of the fact that it has bearing on the profit income losses or assets of such enterprise at the time of the transaction or any future date at any future date so all these transactions will constitute as an international transaction between two or more associated enterprises as per section 92b so this is the second pillar of transfer pricing provisions the first pillar was to determine whether two enterprises are associated or not and the second pillar is to once two associate two enterprises are associated then what are the transactions which will be included under transfer pricing embed if you ra start reading point number, point number one, two, three, in terms of tangible, intangible assets, so purchase, sale of tangible, intangible assets, any services which is being given, market research, development, accounting, legal, boring, any any uh, transaction with regard to boring, also in terms of guarantee also. The fourth point is very, very interesting, Yogesh, which says anything which impacts profit and losses. Yes, yeah, so most of the so, items. So, so, so you are specific. The government is becoming specific and when they realize that maybe they will miss out anything then they suddenly will say that okay fine now it also includes anything which impacts profit and losses and we have also discussed that transfer pricing will not be applicable if there is reduction in uh, losses i mean uh, uh, profit or increase in losses so basically transfer pricing will not be in invoked there and the fifth point is relating to any restructuring which we are doing. So I think with this, we now we know the definition of associated enterprises and we also know what kind of transactions which are included under this ambit. Yeah. Yes. So what constitutes uh, specified domestic transactions? 
But specified domestic transaction here, what happens that the transfer pricing is, you know, is also bringing into its ambit the domestic transactions. So let's analyze. It is given in section 92 BA. The provision of transfer pricing shall apply to specified domestic transaction if the aggregate book value of the two or more entity transaction value exceeds rupees 20 crores of the eligible businesses. So two criteria are given under the specified domestic transaction. The first, it has to be the, you know, there's a monetary threshold limit, which is based, which is, you know, prescribed as rupees 20 crores. And second, the two enterprises, you know, the one of which the should be carrying on any eligible businesses. So what are those eligible businesses? Uh, you know, eligible businesses means those businesses covered under section 80 IA, IAB, IAC, IB, IC, IE, and section 10 double A. So let's see an example of, you know, eligible business under section 80 IA. So a group entity has two units, suppose one unit is eligible unit whose profit is 100% exempt and another non-eligible unit, which is not covered under section 80 IA and is taxable at 25% rate. So in order to reduce the profit and pay less taxes of non-eligible unit, transaction is made between eligible and non-eligible unit so that the profit of the eligible unit is increased which ultimately exempts from the tax, such transaction will attract the provision of transfer pricing and transaction will be re-evaluated at arm's length price and tax will be levied. So this is mainly focusing on the group entities where one, you know, one entity of the group is absolutely, you know, tax exempt and the other one is, you know, there is a tax which is 25%. So all in all, what happens that the profit is shifted from a you know higher tax bracket rate to uh, to an entity where uh, the tax is either low or the you know the tax is absolutely exempt on the profit. Moving on to the next example for you know manufacturing and non-manufacturing unit, a group entity has a manufacturing unit which is taxable at so here an example has been taken on the difference between the tax rate of the two entities. So let's continue with the example. A group entity has a manufacturing unit which is taxable at 15% tax rate under section 115BAD and another non-manufacturing unit which is taxable at the rate of 25% which is a company. And the transaction is taken between them to shift the profit of non-manufacturing unit to the manufacturing unit so that the group entity pays less taxes as I was discussing before. Such transaction will attract the provision of transfer pricing and transaction will be re-evaluated at arm's length pricing and tax will be levied on that. So this is the crux or the definition of the specified domestic transaction, which is defined under section 92 BA. So next we'll be briefing on what is arm's length pricing and the methods of computing it. So what is arm's length pricing? Uh, transfer pricing means determination of correct market price. So basically arm's length price is the correct market price. If you will relate my examples, my previous examples where the, you know, where the Tata Motors were selling the, you know, uh, car formula to its another associated enterprises on rupees 10 crores, while the same car formula was being uh, sold to another non-associated enterprise, which was 50 crores. So in this case, the the actual or the correct market price was 50 crores. So this is what is all about the arm's length pricing, which says to pick the you know, correct uh, market price. So for this purpose, there are methods prescribed. The most appropriate method can be used to determine the arm's length pricing. And yes, there is a, you know, there is a, there is a gap or the variation given that if the transaction happens, between uh, you know two wholesale whether the where the entity is engaged into into the business of wholesale or the retail then a variation of one percent and the three percent is allowed between the actual transaction price and the arm's length price so this variation or this gap is given under the provision of the transfer pricing and yes section 92c prescribes us the methods of computing transfer pricing which are the comparable uncontrolled price method the most common the cup method, the resale price method, 
the cost plus method, the profit split method, transactional net margin method, the other method as prescribed by the board. And yes, there can be a circumstance where more than one arm's length price is computed. So under that circumstances, rule 10 CA has been defined where, you know, which prescribes that how uh, an SSE can pick one arm's length price out of, you know, more than one. I think this is very important. I mean, in this, they are, they are giving the methods of uh, doing the transfer pricing uh, calculation. Yes. Right. How do you determine the transfer pricing as such? And Absolutely. between the two enterprises to compare whether the, the transfer pricing is, is at arm's length or not. Uh, have we did, have we explained what is arm's length? Uh, yes, sir. Arm's length pricing is, uh, as I mentioned before, that it's, uh, you know, it's a uh, market price that has to be determined so basically the the, the most easiest and the common way of determine uh, defining what is arm's length price is basically a price which is an uncontrolled price in an uncontrolled free uh, world so uh, the price which you would have incurred when you have done business with an enterprise which is not your associated enterprise that is the price which the government expects you to do business with your related party also so that there is no erosion of tax base for india and there are these methods to determine whether the the pricing which you have entered into is is at arm's length or not yeah so we can move ahead next is of maintenance and keeping of information and document under section 92d which is very important the the these information or documents are categorized into three the general information, the master file, or the country by country report. So all these documents are, you know, has to be maintained under different circumstances, under different threshold limits. And these documents has to be maintained for, you know, eight years from the end of the relevant assessment year. So let's see what's the general information. Here what happens that every person entering into international transaction or specified domestic transaction shall keep and maintain such information and document as may be prescribed. In case of a foreign associate enterprise, these documents may, may include memorandum of association, article of association, certificate of incorporation, details of foreign branches, last three year financials, etc. These are also called as local files and are required to be furnished on demand to AO within 30 days. And these 30 days can further be extended by another 30 days on request of the SSE. And uh, these records or the documents are required to be maintained if the aggregate value as per the books of international transaction exceeds rupees 1 crore. So a threshold limit again has been prescribed for maintenance of these documents, which is 1 crore. Next is of the master file. So this now master file of country by country report, you know, all these are, you know, more enterprise specific. Here, what happens is if an entity is a constituent entity of an international group, then it shall keep and maintain such information or documents as may be prescribed. The documents maintained over here are called master file. These master files are required to be furnished every year, whether or not the international transaction has taken place. So if you are a constituent entity, then you have to maintain all the, you know, documents and the information as prescribed under the transfer pricing regulations, regardless of the international transaction, which was given, you know, on the, in case of the local files above. The next is for the country by country report, the multinational enterprises would be required to provide information on their global allocation of profit, taxes paid and certain indicators of economic activity among the countries in which they operate. So these were the three, you know, category of the enterprises, or you can say that the information or documents which these three category of enterprise has to maintain. And these and, and there's a time limit also prescribed that for the eight years, all these documents has to be maintained. So suppose if the local file is not maintained, and if the AO calls and you know 30 days limit he will give. And we can extend uh, that 30 days limit to another 30 days. So in, within 60 days, you have to present all these local files. If the if your international transaction exceeds the threshold, monetary threshold limit of rupees one crores, so these documents or the information has to be kept 
and is very important, especially in case of master file also, uh, where there is no threshold give, given in case of country by country report, where there is no threshold limit 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 is given. So moving forward to the reporting. Just, of just one point, there is a confusion in the minds of uh, and many uh, professionals also that if your uh, transaction is less than one CR, you don't need to maintain anything. But no, sir, but in case of, you know, if you are a constituent entity, then you yeah. have to maintain it. Right. Right. Even if you're not a constituent entity, then also from a normal business parallels, because this is just specific to transfer pricing in a normal business parallels, uh, each and every expense or each and every revenue details needs to be maintained properly. And there is a backup document uh, proving in terms of genuineness of those, those expense or that revenue, right? So, so, so what we suggest to our clients is that if your if your aggregate transaction is more than one CR, then you have to do a transfer pricing study, right? In details, and and otherwise you have to maintain the basic documents and details to prove that what you have done is in the normal course of business. Right. I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, move ahead. So reporting of international transaction and specified domestic transactions. Here we will uh, here we will check the forms required, the monetary limit prescribed for submission of those, you know, or the filing of those forms and the penalty if the in case of non-compliance of the reporting or the filing of the forms. So let's say the how to report international and specified domestic transaction. The first form is the form 3CEB. So if an entity undertakes a specified domestic transaction or international transaction, form 3CEB must be filed along with the income tax return. There's a relaxation given for the domestic transactions, which is which uh, value does not exceed rupees 20 crores. This form is a report which is furnished by a chartered accountant under section 92E. The form has an extra which is divided in part A, B, and C. Part A requires detail of the SSC and part B requires detail of about the international transaction with the associate enterprises. Then the part C is solely dedicated for the specified domestic transactions. A due date for filing of Form 3CB is 30th November of the assessment year related to the previous year for which the report is to be filed. And there's a penalty also attached in case of non-compliance with the requirements under Form 3CEB. Uh, these penalties are divided into three categories you know, for non furnishing of a report, which is the Form 3CEB. Penalty of rupees 1 lakh will be attracted. In case of inadequate information, fine of 2% of the transaction amount will be attracted. And in case if there is an error in the information provided, there is a penalty of 2% of the transaction amount. So these are the penalty associated with the form 3CE. Now, this is very, very important, Yogesh. And uh, even if you are doing one rupee international transaction, which is, which is with related party, you have to file form 3CB. Even for a one rupee transaction. Absolutely. And the penalty is, is very, very stringent and very massive. And the government takes it very, very seriously. Uh, the, the limit of 20 CR is only for domestic related party transaction. Right. And uh, you have already stated the timeline to file Form 3 CB, and this is online, which needs to be filed online with the department. Earlier, we used to do manual submission, but now this is online, right? Moving forward, uh, for the you know master file, there are you know form. There's a form called which is Form 3 C E A A. It has got uh, Part A and Part B, and there's another form which is Form 3 C E A B. So let's read about each and every you know form and its part, its app applicability, the due date, and the penalty attached. So every constituent entity, once again, I recall that the master file is to be you know filed or has to be maintained by the constituent entity. So every constituent entity of an international group, irrespective of threshold applicability, whether entity is resident or not. So this has to be you know filed. And the due date is on or before the due date of filing of income tax return. And for the 
part B of this form. Again, the constituent entity designated by group only if the prescribed threshold is met by the international group. So here I've given a reference to the reference a refer note which describes the threshold limit. In the node one, we can see that there's a threshold for master file compliance for form 3CEAA part B and 3CEAB. So a consolidated group, if a consolidated group revenue for the accounting year exceeds rupees 500 crores rupees and aggregate value of international transaction during the accounting year exceeds rupees 50 crores rupees or in respect of intangible property during accounting year exceeds rupees 10 crores. So these are the two, you know, criteria which has to be fulfilled for, for, for filing part B of the form 3CEAA. And the due date prescribed over here is on or before the due date of filing of income tax return for the form 3CEAB. In case of multiple, you know, constituent entities in India by designated, every designated constituent entity has to file form 3CEAB. And the due date prescribed over here is at 30 days before the date of filing 3CEAA form. And the penalty over here is it's a, it's a very stringent penalty, which is given under section 271AA, subsection 2, which is rupees 5 lakhs. Prescribed authority may direct to pay such penalties. So this was in relation to the master file for the constituent entities, the due date, the penalty, the threshold limit. Yeah, we can move ahead. Moving forward, it's about the CBC report, the country by country report. Here, let's first refer to the note number two, which is the threshold for uh, CBCR compliances. Here, the consolidated group revenue in preceding accounting year, if it exceeds rupees 5500 crores, then CBCR reporting would be required. Under the form 3C, uh, yes, and the forms which are for the country by country reporting are the 3CAC, AD, AE. And the applicability criteria are that the intimation of details of parent entity or alternate reporting entity of the group which will file CBC report. This is the applicability criteria and the due date for this is at least two months prior to the due date of filing form 3C AD, which we will read in the next, uh, you know, the next form is the form C A D. So every parent entity or alternate reporting entity resident in India or the constituent entity in India in case of country in which parent entity is located does not have an agreement of exchange of CBCR with India. And the due date for this is within 12 months from the end of the reporting accounting year. The for the form AE, in case of again multiple constituent entities in India and country of parents entity or alternate reporting entity does not have agreement for exchange of CBCR with India by designated constituent entity which will file form 3 CEAB. And here the due date is within 12 months from the end of the reporting accounting year, which is the assessment year. And the penalty for non-compliances for the CBC report is given under you know, note 3. Let's read. The penalties for non-compliances with the requirements of CBC reporting, which is given in section 271 GB. The non-filing of CBC report by, <coughs> excuse me, Non-filing of CBC report by Indian resident parent company or alternate resident company is under you know form 3 CEAD. It's 5,000 per day up to one month from the due date. It is 15,000 per day beyond one month from the due date. And it is 50,000 per day for continuing default after service of notice. This is very stringent. <clears throat> and not furnishing the information called for by the Indian tax authority <clears throat> within the given time limit, 5,000 per day up to service of penalty order or rupees 50,000 per day for default beyond date of service of penalty order. And furnishing inaccurate details or non-filing of corrected report within 15 days, it's rupees 5 lakhs paid. So <clears throat> this was all about the penalties. If uh, you know an enterprise is not in non-compliant with the CBC report, as I said that this this is very stringent. The government is very stringent in terms of implementing transfer pricing provisions. 
In fact, transfer pricing lit litigations related to transfer pricing were most in the initial years. Uh, uh, I think from 90s to 2010-15. Now it has got reduced because things have settled a bit and things have become little standardized. Right. Absolutely, sir. So we are done with our slide for the transfer pricing. Okay. So I think uh, <clears throat> this is a good uh, uh, presentation which uh, uh, we have been able to do today. Uh, and this basically covers the scope of transfer pricing, what is the related party, who are related party associates, what are the transactions which are included in it, what are the reportings which we need to do, and also uh, penalties if, if you are not able to comply with the provisions. And as a firm, we, we have that expert expertise of, of working with multiple global entities in, and helping them to do transfer pricing compliance. I just take a couple of minutes and explain in terms of what we as a firm, we do. Uh, so there are four pillars of work which we do. One is cross-border structuring wherein transfer pricing includes. Then we also do fundraising compliance and due diligence. So this is corporate governance and financial control. And we also do some transaction advisory and IB been working with uh, most of the unicorns in India and globally. We have global offices. And I think <clears throat> moving ahead, if you have any queries or anything which you want us to help you on, we'll be more than happy to do that. With this, uh, we would want to say bye to you. But today, uh, we